Mm. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another podcast. And today I have another performance specialist with me today. We have Metadoc, who is someone that's uh, hard to... <laughs> we just, we, I was asking him, how do I introduce you? And he's like, well, that's, a, that's I don't know, really. I mean, it's a bit of a contentious point, perhaps. So we can perhaps delve into this. But Metadoc, thanks for joining me. I mean, performance and learning um, is, is something that you said is is at the heart of what you do. And you're a doctor and you have ha have been heavily involved in the aiming uh, community, especially with the Voltaic coaches and the Get Amped program. So I want to cover a lot of the grounds around all of this. Uh, but but how, okay, correct me with the introduction. How should people think about you and your expertise? <laughs> well, lovely introduction, Daniel. I appreciate <laughs> it. And I have to apologize that I have to make you wake up so early to do this. <laughs> it's so still weird. even dark outside. Uh, but yeah, it's hard to define really because uh, I'm most formally foremost a a doctor. So I'm a physician, currently a resident physician undergoing family medicine residency. And my involvement in esports has been pretty niche and non-conventional. So there's not like I didn't study anything in particular to get to this. Uh, I am just someone who was always into esports, always play, always play competitively, and I just wanted to learn more about learning and how to improve. So I just did a lot of like self education on that, reading a lot of research and such. So basically, I guess my title would be something along the lines of a performance and accelerated learning specialist. That's how I would go about it. Perfect. Okay. Well, I mean, that that's that is perfect because I have. I have a lot of questions for you, which is <laughs> obviously good that we are talking so I can ask them. Um, because, of course, uh, I think you, you mentioned you've been uh, privy to some of the stuff I've been doing in, in the aiming community at the moment, just trying to get more of the information out there. And I know that, you know, you, you kind of were attacking it from a different angle. You were trying to, you, know, you, you also looked at the aim training community and were like, OK, these guys know a lot of stuff. They've, they've really pushed the boundaries. Um, of knowledge with regards to performance with aim training and mechanics and you know you you kind of got involved with them and sort of the get amps training program so can you can you talk to me about your involvement with the aim training community and i um, mean you said that your interests you know being essentially quite niche uh, so how, how does it all come together yeah so i guess if, if we take all the way back um I initially actually started on console games, so oof, I know that might trigger a lot of people. But uh, I started on Halo, which was my, my SPS game of choice. And then when I finally got my first like actual gaming PC, pre advanced stage when I first got it, that's where like Valorant was like the real hot thing going on right now. And I had never really uh, played any uh, mouse and keyboard before Valorant. I was like, okay. I'm pretty old. My time is very limited. You know, I was still like doing med school and actually I had, yeah, I was on my third or fourth year of med school. Uh, I had studying out all these things to do. So I was like, I have to be very conscious of the time that I'm investing into this. And I want to learn as efficaciously as possible, right? So that's when I went through the internet, through the Googles and everything and Discord, and I discovered Voltaic. And I was like, I was extremely impressed when I want, when then they had these benchmarks, you know, you've done them yourself where they're, they're tracking exactly what exercises you're doing, what techniques, and then tracking your score, et cetera, et cetera. So I was really, really impressed. And when I went to the community, everyone was also very, like, very highly motivated, very, um, had a, like a growth mindset, which is something that in the gaming community is sometimes hard, difficult to find. So from there, I kind of just like started meeting everyone, started getting involved, especially like in the uh, health space. So I would like give people advice on on stuff like nutrition, exercise, and sleep, and things like that. And eventually, I just you know I talked to to the head guy, Sydney, and I liked to uh, you know I I told him, hey, do you want someone to be on board with the community about the performance? We said yes. So and that's how I started getting involved. Then one particular day, this is how we segue into AMP specifically, I found the secret server, not found it, I was like introduced and put in from Sydney and the, and the rest, a secret server where some of the biggest names in, in Valorant and just uh, attack FPS games in general were, like CSGO players as well. And I was like, what is going on here, right? And that's when they told me, oh, we've been doing like personal aim coaching for these players. And I was like, whoa, this is like something they can that can we can definitely work on we can like 
take this to the next level. I we can work on the different. Um, I can coach your coaches on how to coach, which is kind of redundant, but yes, basically. So we can basically just level up the whole thing. And we just took it. We took the idea. We really polished it. We worked on it for months and months and months and months. Kind of like rebranded everything and then shipped it out as basically um, amped, which is at the time I'm not sure where it is at right now because I had since last left the project. But at the time. It was professional aim training coaching for esports professionals at that tier one and tier two tech uh, level. And it was amazing. It, the work that we were doing and the results we were getting were fantastic. But yeah, that's kind of like the whole way how we got there. Yeah, I mean, you know, whilst we're on the, the topic of, of AMS, is there anything in particular you're proud of in terms of the results or sort of what came about with that program? Yeah, I mean, to be frank, as someone, who mostly just worked uh, with the coaches. I'm mostly proud of the coaches themselves, really. Uh, we started off with eight coaches who were, at the time, you know, the best in their field, right? Like, we got, you had some of them already interviewed. You had Cartoon, you had Maddie, and then we have a bunch of others like Trusty, and who was also an AIM Lab employee. Uh, we had a, a whole array of coaches. And these, you know, I was so impressed by them as individuals. They're young guys who, who took a passion, who really struggled to go really push it to the limits, right? And it, it takes a very specific type of mentality and discipline to do that. And with their knowledge that they already had, we worked on working the actual coaching concepts. In, in esports right now, there's a lot of coaches who, you know, they're very good at what they do in terms of like the mechanics and the knowledge and everything, but not necessarily good as being coaches, right? A player doesn't necessarily be is a good coach and the same works both ways. But then through working with them for those months, it, they became extraordinary individuals that I would have, you know, I would love to be coached by them at any point in time. That was like my biggest like proud moment. And then secondly, it was actually the way that we worked through the whole um, area of aim training. We're very systematic about how we did it. You know, we tried to, if we were trying to, you know, cater to tier one and tier two individual players, we had to go about this like a really smart professional way. So we sat down for like six months. We took every aim concept that existed. We mapped it out into the giant like uh, Miro board, you know, mm -hmm. like we're, as if we're like software developers. And we try to connect everything here and there. What is going wrong? Uh, how do people fix this? You know, problems and solutions and different ways to go about things. And it's quite impressive. So every time I look at it, I'm real, I just pop a smile because it's, it's a very extraordinary thing that I think no one in aim training has done. And it took the eight best minds in aim training and put them into like one consolidated place. So that was really, really something uh, to watch. It's really funny actually, because um, I did see I th this mirror board uh, briefly um when i was working with many ages ago and, and the funny thing is that when i was with aim lab um because i was working with them for for a while i think from like 2020 to 2022 i want to say um yeah that, that, that's about right um and that was actually something i was trying to do i actually i actually had a mirror board as well and i actually created like <laughs> what do i think is the first principles of like aiming and uh and i created right. my own version of that but it but um it wasn't nearly as uh as expansive <laughs> in nature and uh so yeah very impressive and and the reason i was doing it is because i'm like well th no one's really quantified this uh in particularly well no one's really categorized this particularly well and at that time also in 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 the in aim labs in, in of itself they had all these different categories of for aiming and and you know mm. performance and none of them really made too much sense uh really at the beginning or they at least felt a bit too arbitrary um and and so yeah, seeing what the work that that all of you guys did was really really impressive and absolutely took it to a new level. And it, it seems like such a great foundational piece of knowledge uh, that that anyone can can sort of now benefit from, um, you know, years into the future because that work's now finally been done. So um, yeah, really, I was super impressed by that. So and, and Mini did did an amazing job when I worked with him as well with the with the AMP program. So Mini's Mini's awesome. No, Mini Mini's exceptional. And yeah, hopefully, you know, the intention and in, originally behind like AMP and a lot of the resources was that it would all eventually trickle down and be a free resource. 
So I'm hoping uh, we were working at it at the time was like taking that mirror board and basically consolidating into like an actual document that we could just give out to the community. Because Voltaic, I mean, yeah, Voltaic in general was a community that's based on, you know, free resources for everyone to just give it to the general population. So first, you know, we have to make sure everything kind of works at the tire, higher levels and then we were going to like give it out. So hopefully it's something everyone will get to see at some point. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and I think, you know, it's, it's, the program has certainly been getting, I would say, you know, legitimacy just over time because of the people that are using it and like, yeah, this is legit. Um, and yeah, so, I mean, to be honest, that's been a lot, a lot of my channel uh, the last like month or two has been like, okay, th there's people really like this, this type of content because they, I, I feel like, cause there's so many like videos out there of like, oh, you know, how to get good aim and like all these different things. And it, it's, it's, uh, it's it's old information that's not well quantified in, in most cases, and and we don't have the sheer amount of evidence and and you know practices that have been developed and heart honed over time that we that you have in the aiming community, and they're just light years ahead of the aiming community uh, compared to these sort of these other people from from outside of it at this point. So, either way, um, uh, I'm just I'm I'm just really drilling that point home, um, but this really brings me I think to what. For me is is one really big area um of why i wanted to talk to you which is all about skills acquisition because skills acquisition it's it's what we're doing uh, when we're doing the training and i feel like there's not a huge amount of information that i can find that maybe translates either some of the the scientific literature uh, around this into you know something that we can understand as gamers as we apply it to aim training uh so that that'd be a great place to start so what do we need to know about skills acquisition? What do we know about skills acquisition as it as it relates to aim training? Very little. <laughs> so I'll just be honest with that, friend. So I'm asking, I'm responding to that question exactly as you're asking it, right? So related to aim training is very little. So in terms of like the research itself that is done in the particular field of aim training, there's barely none actually done. Amped in Voltaic, I was trying to work with a researcher to actually get some research done so we can actually quantify these and be one of the first organizations to show data and numbers on like this really works. But if we're talking about skill acquisition in general as a science and how we can test a lot of these things with AIM training, then there's a there's a fair amount of research out there and principles that we can like move and test. Uh, usually, you know, the Fundamentally, it's done in like the sports fields, right? So uh, learning and skill acquisition are basically kind of like interrelated, right? So learning in general means the acquisition of skills or knowledge, right? And then skill acquisition is kind of basically a subset of that, which is learning skills, which is procedural knowledge mostly, right? So how to do stuff. Right. And that research mostly comes from like the sports, traditional sports, right? So like baseball, soccer, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and just movements and physiology in general. Um, so that's a really, really big topic. And I just want to make sure where exactly do you kind of like want to start? Do you want to understand a little bit more how learning itself works and then work, work our way down? Or do you have something specific that you want to tackle first? Yeah, we can get, let's get the foundational stuff in there. Okay. Okay. All right. So, uh, how do we learn? This is such a giant topic of interest to me because, you know, I feel like in a lot of ways, that's something that we never really think about. And we can see this like in the school system and, and just in everything in general, where we're just forced to do things a certain ways, maybe through like repetition, just do it a lot, do it a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot. And it's not necessarily very efficient right it's a very time consuming maybe boring and the results that you get might not be exceptional and if anything you're like me right and as most gamers of us are we're trying to be as fast as possible you kind of speed run things let's just get as good as fast as we can right so that's where i took a step back and started looking into like the science of learning um just a quick little plug in there i kind of worked with a company a startup that worked with the science of learning through video games. And we did that for educating like doctors actually. So um, so the first thing I think we should like understand is like how does learning more or less work, right? And it really has to tie in first with like memory. And like how do things cement into your head and we know how to do them, 
right? So it starts with, with the brain. So we start with like sensory memory, which is simply the things that your senses pick up, right? You're looking at here, you're listening here, these are senses, it's just information that's just coming in all the times, right? It's just information, 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 right? But your brain doesn't remember every little thing that's going on, right? So what does that mean? The next step is like working memory, which is the things that your brain is actively trying to sparse out from that flood of, of information. This is the things that I want to kind of like focus my attention on, right? So a really cool example of this is if I told you to remember, you know, my phone number, 787-517-9684, right? How would you go about it if I just told you to remember that? Um, I'd probably, well, there's two ways. There's like re repeating it, but then also trying to create associations with the numbers uh, would be obviously a trick, but, but that's, uh, that's, that's about it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's, that's you, you, you made a step that's actually in the, in the right direction. So most people first, we start off with like repetition. But what we're doing is that we're, we're forcing our brain right there kind of like to put things in a spotlight, right? Like this is the stuff that I want to like focus on, right? And you're going 787-517-9684, right? And so just through that inherently, you know there's a couple things at play that we need to be able to learn something. And one of those is focus and attention, right? So you need to be um, putting that mental effort into something in specific and honing in on that. It, only kids, like when they're really, really young, right? have this like inherent ability where they just absorb information all the time and you know you kind of have a child who knows like five languages and you're like what the hell uh because their brain are very a uh, plastic they can they can change and absorb information differently than when we become like adult brains so but once we're like as we get older we require more like conscious effort into putting our attention on things right so uh so that's the first thing was like focus on attention. And then you added something interesting, which was like you try to create associations. We'll get back to that because that's actually a really good point that you mentioned that we'll, we'll get back on top of how memory works. So, so the first step was like sensory. We put it into working memory. You have attention and focus, right? And then things where you're going to go into like a, kind of like a short-term memory and then long-term memory, right? So everyone has that buzzer like long-term memory. And... How do we things really go into long-term memory? So we found that like if I told you my number right now, 77517, and even if you try to like your hardest to kind of cement it, we always forget things, right? The, the brain is constantly trying to flush out things that it doesn't might, might not really need and that doesn't find find very particularly important. So there's this thing called the Ebbinghaus like forgetting curve and humans on average kind of like forget 50 percent of everything we went through in the day and that we we're trying to learn in the first day by the end of the first week you've lost like 90 percent of it which is kind of crazy right well one of the ways that we really cement things into long-term memory is kind of like recalling the information so that means you learn something seven eight seven five one you know nine six eight four i almost forgot my own phone number and then having to periodically bring it back out of memory, right? So that's just taking it out, pulling back into the front actively. That helps it kind of repeat the cycle of in and out that helps that like those memories form. And that's like it at the most basic level. But I think this really ties into how important it is in terms of like how it applies to skill acquisition. Okay. So now let's move into like the basic like of how memory works, which is, you know, information, focus and attention, and then recalling that information into like skill acquisition, right? So let's just kind of, I don't like to be very preachy or things like that. So let's just talk about like, for example, how you, how have you approached um, improving your skills and Valorant. And then let's take those examples and like sparse them out into like how it's related to skill acquisition. Is that okay? Yes. Yeah, that's totally fine. Um, All right. So, so an approach I would usually take is I would try to just focus on... So, so normally normally I have a a larger principle to focus on. Uh, that's something that, that I need to constantly apply. 
and then there's maybe something more specific. So I'll, I'll try to keep the amount of focuses that I have uh, lesser, but there'll always be something, some things I'm focusing on. So, so for example, in Valorant, it, it you know, when, when I'm working on now, that's more principle, uh, which is, is man advantage, always understanding sort of before, uh, any kind of play is made or, you know, I'm, I'm doing anything significant that I've assessed sort of the situations at 5v5 or 5v3, or, you know, 4v2, you know, whatever, what is the situation? Um, because, and that, that also requires me to habituate to make possibly some extra processes because I might not be checking the mini map, uh, enough in mm -hmm. some of these instances. And I haven't sort of like created enough repetition in a specific, cause it's, I'm trying to create more, more of a habit there, but that's a principle mm -hmm. that I need to be doing all of, all of the time. And then it might be something otherwise that's more specific, uh, which is, you know, ways in which I want to play. Uh, a particular site. Um, I've I, you know, I've learned certain util I want to use, or I, I've I've learned certain specific things, and I'm thinking about I want to practice you know my uh, ability to kind of stay alive or, or play retakes in a situation using you know certain util. So so it's something a bit more broad and something a bit more specific. And I try to always have like some kind of focuses as well as just playing. Um, and that's it. That's that's the main way I I try to improve. All right, perfect. So, so you're already doing some a couple of things that are really good, which is having particular focus. So, it's like if I told you right now, jump on a unicycle, start juggling some pins, right, and then like sing the national anthem, right? How how well do you think you would be able to like do those things like off the rip? Um, I would not be able to do any of those things. I don't think I could do any of those things anyway. Right. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah. right right so part of like the skills acquisition concepts is like breaking things down the skills into their most fundamental levels and principles because then you can grab one work on one thing grab another work on one thing grab yeah. another and then you kind of like add the sum up into the totals right but then we have this very you know interesting thing in esports that we do very often a lot of us do right is simply we just go in let's play ranks let's go right but let's talk about like what do you let's say let's just say with valorant right like what is going on in a match that you're trying to pay attention to right if you kind of just like jump into things and this is like i'm telling you this is something all the way up to radiant this is not like just because you're bronze silver gold or whatever this is something that will go all the way up to radiant right when you're in a match with valorant you're having to pay attention to mechanical skills, which is the actual, you know, mechanics of uh, movement and aiming, uh, pre-aiming, et cetera, et cetera. But then you're also paying attention to more like the cognitive stuff of like looking at the mini map, okay, taking account of like how many skills were used in terms of like player positioning, communication, da 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 So many of us don't take this whole barrage of skills and break it down into smaller ones and practice those in ones individually and differently right we kind of just like go for it and what you're doing is jumping on a unicycle trying to juggle pins and trying to sing the national anthem that's basically what you're doing and sure repeating enough times eventually you know after thousands of hours maybe you'll be able to do all those three but in no way are you gonna be able to do that as fast as if like oh first i'll learn how to juggle get pretty good at it maybe i'll stand on a, you know those wobbly exercise uh, balls and that way i can work on balance and from there work on getting on the unicycle and from there work on like talking and then from there to singing and you don't know, you progressively work your way up like that because your brain is not very good at multitasking and whoever you know the concept of multitasking is just basically a myth it's, it doesn't exist it your brain can only kind of like work on one thing when it's uh, particularly in the realm of like learning and declarative knowledge, right? So we the basic thing about skill acquisition is first break it down into the things that are the most fundamental, right? And you can take it even a step further, which is have you ever heard of the the Pareto principle? Yeah, yeah, eighty twenty. I was actually thinking about whether I'd ask you a question about that and say, oh, what is the twenty percent? Right. Uh, in the training, right. but yeah, go ahead. Right. So, so if everyone hasn't heard of that, Pareto principle simply means that eighty percent of the benefits come from like twenty percent of the actions or things. And this has been seen like everywhere from nature to like companies like oh, 
eighty um, percent of the apples came from twenty percent of the apple trees in this like patch. Oh, what the hell! In a company, oh, like eighty percent of the productivity or results came from like twenty percent of the employees. Oh, so this is something I just seen everywhere. So we take that into context and we put it into like into a video game. What do you think in your game is the twenty percent? Where is it that you'll get the most benefit, the most improvement, and the most, accel the most acceleration in your game, right? Is it from the macro? Is it from communication? Is it from, you know, being able to count the skills and keep track of these things? Is it from the mechanics, et cetera, et cetera? What do you think would be the, the 20 in Valorant? Um... It, yeah, I was, I was thinking about this when I was like thinking about this as a potential question because I, I really don't know. I mean, it's it's really difficult because I definitely think that, I, I definitely think Valorant is might make an argument to require more like raw revs than some other games because there's so many variables. But at the same time, I I also generally think that, and this is why I'm asking all the like the skills acquisition questions because I'm kind of trying to get to. Well, what what are then the best practices for how much time we should spend, how we should spend that time, and so on? Yeah. And so that that really is the question, and, and I, I'm really not sure because because I feel like you do need a lot of time at the same time. Like I feel like you need like yes. minimum four hours a day, honestly. Like to that that would be like a, the minimum I I could see where you could apply like a good level of high quality repetitions and and you'd be able to for that whole duration have high quality repetitions and that's kind of how i've judged it is how like what is the integrity of your reps um and as soon as the integrity starts to drop off well that then let's let's you know let's stop playing that, that's that's been how i've thought about it okay yeah so you're judging about different points and we'll get to it by yeah. the way i'm hoping by i'm hoping at the end of this conversation like i know we're very like theoretical right now i'm gonna give you like you know top 10 things to do for your practice session like i'll, I'll be very practical about it and now it's just kind of going through the understanding. So, so I think the Pareto principle is exceptional. And I, I also believe, it is my belief, that it's also dynamic. And by that, I mean, it changes depending on where you are and what your goals are. So, for example, I would say if I am, you know, below Radiant or something, um, below Immortal, uh, etc., the Pareto principle for me and Valorant would be mechanics. Right. And then the thing is, like, you can keep applying the Pareto principle flowing down. So, OK, so the most improvement would be in mechanics. OK, in mechanics, then you have to divide that even further. OK, there's right arm, left arm. I, I go that way, like that far with mechanics. Like, how good is your right arm, left arm? Because left arm, you're working with movement and, you know, the crouching, trafing, um, silent walking, all these other things. Right arm aiming. Right. But then you break it down even further in terms of like aiming on the right on the right hand. You have like, you know, you got tracking, you got switching, you got clicking, you got and then you survive it even further because that's where Voltaic comes in. You got like the static and then the dynamic, etc. So you can really, really, really like take those skills and like break them out a lot. And then when you think about that, you're like, OK, out of all these like different skills, what is what are the ones that give you that 20 percent specifically? that, you know, the 20% that give you the 80% results in Valorant, right? So specifically in Valorant, you know, things like tracking, it's not of the most use, right? It's a Valorant's a game where it's kind of like you, you hit them once in the head and that can be the, like, that's the shortcut way to get a kill, right? So tracking has its use, but is it maybe part of the 20%, you know, that gives the 80% results? Maybe not. So that way you're starting to hone in on where the, are the skills that will really push you to the five highest like results the fastest, right? Are we following so far? Yeah. Okay, cool. All right. So I encourage everyone to kind of like give an attempt on doing this. Um, for even if you know, when we're talking about Valorant, but I like to be general, like this applies to anything, it may, maybe any skill in life, basically. It's just to take it down, break it down as however you can and see like, huh, where do you think all of this stuff lies, right? So for Valorant, me specifically, I focused, I was like, my 20% my repair principle was aiming. And I never played mouse and keyboard, so let's just work on aiming. That's how I came to the take. So I worked on aiming. And then the second thing would be then what it, like, principles of actual skill acquisition. Because right now you're kind of just still mapping it out, right? Now we get to the nitty gritty of 
how do we actually get good and fast? So that's where the skill acquisition comes in. And I can think, I can talk about like three, let's just make it down. Let's make it very simple. Three principles of skill acquisition, right? It all comes down under the umbrella of like pers purposeful practice. And there's this like researcher called Anders Ericsson that did this, I think it was like in the nineties, right? Where, where the people that were doing the best in their field, the people who were the, just the top of the top, are the individuals that practice right regularly sure and we'll talk about like timing of practice to make it make it as efficient as possible but people who practice but not only practice they practice with intent and with purpose which sounds silly but it's actually really really hard to do and in gaming we really have a bad time with actually doing this mm. um we kind of like do that whole autopilot thing where we just like queue up, we play, we don't have really maybe a specific goal. We're just like, all right, let's just get some dubs and let's go about it, right? So that is like one real spiral down to nothingness. That's not, that, that will give you some benefits because, you know, repetition just gives you benefits by default, but it's really extremely subpar, okay? So let's talk about then some of the three principles that we can talk about. One would be um, contextual interference or something called interleaving, right? The second one that I would like to work on and talk about would be um, augmented feedback, okay? And then the other one would be basically distributed practice. So let's just kind of go into each one. Okay. So number one. Distributed practice. I like to give analogies. I feel like it's a lot easier to understand analogies. So, is there a sport that you play or anything in particular? Video games. Yeah, like soccer. <laughs> oh, oh, shit. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. I'll, I'm just trying to make something like outside of video games so it's easier to understand. So, <laughs> let's let's say baseball, right? It's, it's just a very simple sport to think of if you swing a bat at a ball, right? Yep, yep, yep. Very simple. But then we'll put it, we'll tie it in into like how it would work with Valorant or gaming in general. So in baseball, right, there's a couple of different ways you can go about practicing something. Imagine someone is throwing, you know, you know, the, the pitching machines that kind of just like, yeah, you, you, you can set them to shoot at like the same speed or whatever, right? If someone's pitching you the same ball over and over the same speed, everything is exactly the same. What's going to happen with the way that you're practicing that, right? You're going to... Yeah, oh, go ahead. Because they're going to start anticipating the shots. Well, you're not going to be reading the... Yeah, there's like some aspects that, that you're not... Yeah. Right, exactly. So if you get thrown, thrown the same fastball over and over and over again, you basically, you just start learning like the sequence and the timing, and your brain shuts off. It just goes into like an autopilot, mm. right? And now we, this is where we tie it in to like what we said earlier, what is one of the biggest things for learning and like memory in general is that recall, bringing things out actively from memory to the forefront. So basically keeping engaged with uh, the task or skill that you're trying to do and improve on, right? Yeah. So, so this is where this distributed practice and mass practice concepts come in. So this concept is called interleaving. Right. So that means the benefit that you get from getting thrown a, f a hundred fastballs in a row really quickly starts diminishing. And instead of doing that to keep your like yourself on edge and alert and attend would be, hey, throw fastball here, then randomly throw you know one of those curveballs or a slider. I don't even know what they're called. Uh, then throw one of those drop balls. Again, I'm not a baseball player, but the ones <laughs> kind of like drop. Right. So it makes you always be makes your brain always be very attent and makes you really start focusing on learning the cues differently and it also forces your muscles to have to you know each type of different ball you would need different muscles to really execute that swing right so you're you're you're, you're paying attention to many different things and most importantly just to keeping the brain actively involved so there's a caveat to this which is as you're a beginner in something, right, let's say, and I really want to make sure that people understand this, like, no matter if you're a Radiant or a pro gamer, you could be a beginner in a very specific sub skill, right? 
let's say you're freaking tens or whoever, and you're an expert level, you know, grid shot, you know, player. Right. But maybe you're an extremely novice at like the one of the harder tracking ones, right? So it really depends on the skills. Really try to frame your minds that it's it depends on where you're at for that skill. So the more beginner you are in a specific skill that you feel like it's really hard, then yes, having more repetition where it's kind of more or less the same for a little bit is good. And then as you start getting better, you decrease the amount of like the same repetition and add in the interleaving, which is the different variations of it. Okay. So like, for example, if you, let's you, let's say you were doing aim training right now and Let's say I started doing, it's my first day aim training, or yeah, let's just do the first day aim training. I would pick three different, you know, um, scenarios, right? Let's say each one tests something different. One is tracking, one is switching, one is clicking, etc. And then first I'll do, you know, 10 of this one, 10 repetitions of this one, 10 of this one, right? And then maybe after that, I can do five of this one, five of this one, five of this one. And then maybe that one, one, one. And then maybe put it on shuffle mode to then have different ones coming randomly. You see how I'm, how, what I'm saying? Yep, yep. So the first rep repetitions are to sort of like get your brain kind of a, a little bit more accustomed to it, understanding what your body kind of needs to execute the thing. And then you keep it on its toes. Keep it on its toes. Always try to increase the variability on it. So that's one of the biggest things. That's why, like in in aim labs, like the the shuffle mode, as you get better with different like playlists, shuffle mode is extremely useful. It keeps you on your toes. You have to execute execute different things. The neural motor connection changes every time, mm. and that that increases your your ability to respond to different situations. Were you gonna say something? Oh yeah, no, I was just uh, sort of you know, general agreement. But it just reminded me that one of the reasons I like the benchmarks is because. You get a lot of variability just within the give it the benchmark and even if like what, what, mm. i actually made a video yesterday that released about the sort of advertising the voltaic benchmarks as somewhere to start because it kind of solves the difficulty question to some extent where because you need to be challenging yourself to enough of a degree and most people when they go into aim training they're like okay here's the task i don't really know like it's just too easy it's just too hard and this and so so i'm like okay just start at the beginning start at novice and then just work your way through and and uh, you know you'll you'll be able to jump around the entire playlist like just as as you would like to as you start to see maybe like you know you're getting a little bit bored that that could be a good indication that just switching to a different task is actually going to be better for training because you're, you'll be a bit more sort of attentive essentially because it's just different yeah and then but it, one of the things that you and i also warn this to everyone is that when this happens your performance will drop so the literature and the research shows that as you increase like these difficulties and do interleaving and things like that, on the short term, you will suck. <laughs> you <laughs> will do worse because obviously it is more difficult for you. You have to anticipate like there's more things involved. But the long term learning and improvement is dramatically faster. So that is just something I, I also like put it on the forefront because if you feel like, oh, I'm just put on shuffle mode, see how I do. And then your score in, on each and all of them across the board drop, you know, 10 percent or whatever. And you people might get discouraged and like, no, I'm not doing this. And they'll stop. <laughs> uh, that's don't. That's a good thing. Right. We're doing good. That's what's kind of like it's supposed to happen. Yeah. But you'll get the long term benefits down the road. Right? It, it reminds to, me of something as well, that th this is something that uh anecdotally i've experienced many 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 times over the years and i just like i just noticed the pattern and I, but i don't know the mechanism behind it and and it's this this sense that you know you can have like maybe maybe even like two weeks of just feeling like like you're just the practice is doing nothing and mm. you're just sucking and then one day like all of this everything that was suddenly a struggle it just one day you're just like i'm just better today and all of those problems are just gone and I'm just better <laughs> not to, to think about those things. And and I've experienced that so many times. So is that is that some some is that speaking to sort of what you're talking about a bit? It's 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 hard to say because like the example I know very well what you mean, but it, it might be it, when we talk about performance, it's such a multifactorial thing. Yeah. Right? There's the aspects of like the mental side and the physical side, how well you rested, how well did you warm up, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it's hard to say. But I do say I do get the sense that 
there there seems to be like especially if you were doing tasks or you were trained that's quite complicated i feel like it takes your brain a, a fair amount of time for it to really sink into the level that it becomes kind of like unconscious and that's when it like when it mm. does happen and boom like you're like oh oh this got so 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 much better and, but it, it i can't really say with any certainty usually consolidation of memories and skills um takes around like three hours and things like that so it's it's kind of weird that it it's it, sometimes it takes a week or two in when some of the things like click um but it's multivectorial that's the best i think i can say for that i can't really say with any certainty if that phenomenon is due to this <laughs> it just and you just reminded me of another uh another co concept which i actually want to talk talk about in a video sometime which is like the four stages of competency um mm. So it's like you, unconscious com incompetence, unconscious incompetence, compet yeah, like conscious competence, yeah. unconscious competence, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. and that, that's that's a good illustration too of 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 what you just described. I think where you're like you're moving through the training is taking you through the stages of of oh I'm now aware that I suck at this thing and now I'm uh, mm -hmm. and I've just gone from not being aware so I'm like moving up the train and then you get to the all all the way to. Okay, now this is intuitive. Now this is something that is automatic. Um, and that's yeah. also another question is, you know, we can talk about is intuition. Um, that's a, oh, that's for a sure. big, big topic as well. Um, yeah, absolutely. We can, uh, if you want, let me, we can finish like the two other principles, yes, like yes, yes. The core principles. So everyone gets something they can take home and like work on. 100%. Um, so the, the second one would be like the mass practice versus distributed practice, right? And this is something that we are also horrendous at, right? So the thing, the concept is basically some people, they'll sit on, they'll practice baseball, practice a game or whatever, six hours straight, seven hours, eight hours. You know, there's people who play 12, 10, 12 hours straight, right? Yeah. All right. Do we think that's like an efficient at all? Is that what the brain and the neurophysiology and just like muscle physiology says is best? Absolutely not. Will that help learning? No. But you think, oh, but I'm getting more reps in. I'm playing more. So if I'm playing more, I should just get be getting better more. No, that's just that's just not how that works. Um, we need for information to come in, right? We'll do the repetition, the purpose of practice, and then we need it to cement it in the long-term memory, and then we need to bring it back out. And then we'll let it rest, and we'll bring it back out. If you're always just kind of like being active with it, you're not giving, letting it kind of sit in the back, sink in, before bringing it back out again, right? So that's part of the concept of like distributed practice. So for example, if you, let's say we're doing the same three, I'm, I'm using very general broad like names right so like uh, a, um, a switching technique an uh, exercise a tracking exercise and a clicking right very broad so let's say that you practice today some switching mm -hmm. right if it's the first day you practice it you practice it for an x amount of time let's say it's 20 minutes or something right you don't want to do it for five hours six hours etc but you remember how in the past we, we talked about the forgetting curve that as time goes on, we start forgetting things. So basically, we space out this practice in a way that it counteracts the forgetting curve. So basically, let's say we worked on this task for 20 minutes in the morning or whatever. We can do it again for 20 minutes at night the first day. And then we'll do it once again the day after. But then we won't do it again until three days down the road. And then we won't do it again until seven days down the road and then until two weeks and then a month and then three months, et cetera. So what we're doing is just kind of as we get better on something, we have to keep like reviewing and bringing it out of the long term memory. But we keep spacing out when we do it. Right. Because a lot of what I see is that people have some routine or some practice or something and they just do the same thing over and 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 over again, day after day. Right. And we're all kind of like. You all have been blamed to this at some point, right? We just do it again, this routine, this day, and this routine, this day, da, 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 da. But the brain really wants time for the for information to let it sink in through consolidation, sleep, and all these things. And then kind of be on the edge of forgetting and bring it back out. Because being on the edge of forgetting also means that you have to be very active and the brain has to be very active in pulling that information out and focusing on it. And we keep going back to this concept of you have to be very active with 
the way that your brain ticks all the information. So space it out. As you get better, though, if you're having a lot of difficulty with a certain skill or task, and it's just like you tried it the first day, didn't do well, second day, didn't do very well, then don't space it out to three, five, seven days afterward, right? You just kind of keep repeating. But as you get better, then you start breaking it out like that. Or do, do we kind of like follow? Yeah, yeah, I'm not, but it's, okay. it's funny because, you know, I think everyone's question is like, well, then I'm getting to a spot where I just don't practice anymore, almost, if you, if you know what I mean, because if you're spacing things out to a degree where it's, so, yeah. So, yeah, well, it doesn't really, because at this whole time, you're always practicing different skills. Right, right, right. Okay, like, you're, just, for yeah, example, you're just cycling in other things. Right, yeah, right. Yeah. You're yeah. not just stopping practicing, you're <laughs> just cycling between skills. Mm -hmm. So, like, mm -hmm. we did, we, we did this for switching, but then let's say then we did tracking after that so the yeah, next yeah. day i did tracking but that means that i did a little so if the first day you did switching and the next day you started tracking um so you do tracking but then you're also doing the switching from the day before because that that task you have to do the next day yes and then you have these two tasks right and then next day on the third day you're not doing the first one because you already spaced it out for another one you're repeating the second one and then adding the third one and you see how you like it just kind of like compounds. You're just adding different skills. And as they space out, you're still like naturally pulling in other skills and, and practicing them, those inside. Gotcha. So no, it's, not, it's not stopping practice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That, that totally makes sense. And is this something that is uh, the same, whether it's, let's say, because there's, there's a difference, let's say, between practicing aiming technique and where you're, you know, using the mouse to, you know, you know hit a target. And that's different to let's say changing a way that you might make a decision. Um, so mm. habituating a different decision. So is, is there a practical difference between those two things or is it still essentially, okay, this is just the way that, that I'm, I'm just putting focus on a specific thing that requires change less learning. And that's, mm -hmm. and that's kind of, that's kind of it. No, it, so, so far it should be the same, uh, because you can see this and you see this very often with. I don't know if you ever use something like flashcards. Yeah. Uh, we there's these like systems like Anki where it's the same thing for but for declarative knowledge using the space repetition. So like you'll do a flashcard one day, you do it, then it'll reset for three days, seven days, etc. So it works both ways. And a lot of the things that we do for procedural knowledge, like skills and aiming, a lot of it also goes the same way for declarative knowledge, which is like learning facts and, and names and things like that. So for this, it goes both ways. You you can do it for both just the same. Okay. That's, that sounds, that's good. <laughs> that's good. Yeah. Because um, one of the things I've actually been trying to, uh, I don't know when I'll, I'll be able to finish it, but I'm trying to actually create something, not like the, the aiming spreadsheet, but that, that you to, oh, sorry, the aiming mirror board that you mentioned, but but something sim a bit more similar for general improvement that kind of goes and covers some of the stuff that's not aiming, that is to do with more mm -hmm. decision making or positioning or creative problem solving or, you know, just the different things that you're needing to do in the game that you could work on, you know, just breaking those down for people so people can have specific, like, like you mentioned, like, okay, I'm working on this. And they can also rate themselves on certain things so they can start, because I also, I don't know if you have... Um, had me talking about the ABC game, the, the Jared Tendler's inchworm concepts. Um, essentially, yeah. that the, the short of it is that you look at performance as a range and you can categorize or like break that range down into A, B, and C, A being your best performance and C being your worst. And so whenever you're, you know, you can't change that, you know, you start performing on a given day and that's where you're at in that moment. And maybe in that moment, you're in your C game. You're in, this is like the worst part of your range of performance. And so what you would want to do is you'd want to be able to clearly sort of define what is it that characterizes your C game? What is it that characterizes mm -hmm. your A game? So just strengths and weaknesses ultimately, but it allows, I think, a greater focus. It allows us to be curious about what is our performance right now and what is it doing? And then you can start to say, and I think with, with having, you know, more of that sort of linguistic support, having a model there that's more framework people could look at, they could be like, okay, well, actually it seems like I'm making these kinds of mistakes. Um, I have either like on, on the mental game or the, the, maybe the physiological side, my sleep's really bad or like, you know, what, all these different things that can impact performance, what can they focus on and work on actively and just, and just making it a bit easier for people, uh, much like with that, uh, aiming mirror board is it like, you know, some version of that to help people with being able to pick the things that they want to put the attention on, um, so that they can have more intentional training. 
I think that's a great idea because I also have the same idea <laughs> back in the past. Because <laughs> the same thing, like I, I never played like attack FPS like Valorant, right? So to me, it was like a lot of information, like overload. And that's the thing is taking overload and breaking it down to things like that you can understand and therefore you're not overloaded. Yes. Right. So and putting names and and labels and just breaking down those pieces apart really helps with that. That comes also like to play with like cognitive load theory, but maybe that's a little bit. It is definitely tied into the context, but we don't really have to get into that. Uh, but I agree with you. Um, just being this kind of like ties in then to feedback, right? When you can, which is the third thing about skill acquisition, which is being able to name, label, identify, quantify things means that you can actively work on them, get feedback, and and keep moving forward, right? But there's also some tricks to feedback, and this is something that I see also particularly, well, traditional sports too, but particularly in gaming coaches, right, is how to give feedback, when to give feedback, and what type of feedback. And you're like, whoa, even feedback has different ways, yeah. So, so we're, now we're going into the realm of like augmented feedback. And I think the general principle also applies, which the general principle so far is as you start off in something, you know, start simple, start with a lot of help, practice like, you know, repetition, whatever. And as you get better, make it harder, interleave, et cetera. So the same thing applies to kind of like to feedback. When we give feedback, um, and this is something I talked to many and everyone else, was one, the the type of feedback is very important. So feedback can be things like descriptive, right? So saying what the error that you made was. Two, it can be like prescriptive, saying this is how you fix it, like prescribing, right? Like an, a solution. Uh, then there's also things like timing. So if I made a mistake and you're watching me play Valorant, you go, boom, mistake, wrong. Right, right. That's like immediate feedback versus like, oh, I finished the round or I finished the game, and you're like, oh, all right, let's talk about the feedback, and that's like delayed feedback. That's the timing of things how it changed. Right? Um, and these all matter a lot. So one, for example, as you start out in a said skill, or like I said, like I said, it depends on where you are. If you're radiant, it still applies to you if the skill is new. So. As you start off with a specific skill, you want that feedback to be sooner, right? And to be more prescriptive and dis prescriptive, right? So telling you like, how do we fix it, right? But that's just like at, at the start. It's just telling you, okay, this is how you should do it. Pay attention, boom, right? Because at the start, you're not very good at understanding where the problems lie. So you need to have it like pretty quick. This is what happened, boom make your brain pay attention. This is what happened. Take, take note, right? As you get better, you want the feedback to be more delayed and to be more in terms of like descriptive. Why? So when it's delayed and descriptive, meaning saying like, oh, there was an error here. What do you think it was? It allows what you want to train is the individual, me, the player, or you, the player, is to self-recognize errors. You want the, the, per the person to be self-sufficient. This is something that we taught in AMT and it's something that was like a general principle was like, if you work with us for the, for the eight weeks, which is usually how long we worked, we don't want you to have to like come back again for coaching. Because coaching in essence is to help you be self-sufficient, for you to recognize your own problems, to recognize how to fix them and how to approach them, right? We don't want you to have to like co keep coming back and just being held by the hand. Because then that leads to a second problem, which is something called guidance hypothesis, which is if you have someone always basically holding your hand, how are you going to do when, you, when they let go? All right. If you have someone is always telling you what to do, how you're doing it wrong, when that person is not there or that source or resource is not there, how are you going to react? How are you going to work through the problems? People kind of crash and burn. Right. So if you have a coach who's always telling you, do this, you gotta do that, you gotta do this, da, 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 you're not learning how to recognize the cues. You're not learning how to when these problems arise, how to address them. Right. So very useful in the start, right? So ideally, if you were if I were coaching you, I would have you do the exercise and everything while I'm watching originally, right? Pay close attention. I'll be like, what's going on? This happened, da da da. 
as we kind of progress, I'll be asking you more questions and like delaying. So like, what do you think you did wrong? Or like, what do you think this could have gone better? How would you have approached this and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it's allowing you to like, using that knowledge of how to address things priorly and how to recognize them using now actively for you to do it now in the present for yourself. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, makes sense. And it's, it's kind of mm -hmm. the, it's a, reminds me of the, you know, teach, teach a man to fish versus give him a fish you know, type of thing. And it's, <laughs> yeah, that's fair. I think it's really important too. It's, it's one of the reasons why, uh, I, I like, I, I like to try to understand things more principally because if I feel like if I can explain them from that place or help people to understand that, then they can derive things from that themselves, as opposed to mm -hmm. having to, as you say, like need to look up the answer all the time. They already have the tools and knowledge because you just gave that to them. And so they have this up to them now. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, exactly. And with that, we, this is like, this is very like overview, superficial level of things, but that is kind of like some of the most well-researched principles in, in skills acquisition. One is the, the, the uh, interleaving, which is, you know, mixing in skills as you get better. And secondly, it would be the uh, distributed practice with spacing it out. And then third would be kind of like the augmented feedback. There's all, there's a, way more that we can go into which i think is some of the things that i wanted like ideally i want to work with you know full t1 esports teams usually so far i've only done like individuals but with full teams to to use more research that's been grounded on team-wide approaches right instead of just like individuals you do a mix of both working with individual and the teams and there's a lot of things that we can talk about there in terms of like the research on how to improve that but i think those that's a really good foundational layer of how to address you know proving on the game for you as an individual um it depends on, like where you want the conversation to go next from here yes yeah, so, i mean so you talked about those those three principles are there any other best practices you know we we sort of we sort of touched oh, yeah. on the time um like how much time is is good versus how much time is bad and i think i think what well, we, we sort of agreed essentially on just like keeping the reps high quality so if, if you get to the point where based on what you said, but if you get to the point at which you're struggling to have that deliberate or the intentional part of the practice, um, and you're sort of definitely starting to go through the motions pretty heavily, that's probably a stopping point. Is that, does that make sense? Mm. So, yeah, you know what, we can tie this in. Cause like, that's one of the points that I have of the, uh, 10 practical tips okay. and tricks that's like neuroscience based. So we can go into that because that's one of the points, Perfect. actually number three. <laughs> oh, nice. Okay. Here we go. Okay. Okay. So, so what we just talked about was kind of like a brief overview of like skills acquisition. I encourage everyone to kind of like, um, really start applying and like any skill, even skill acquisition is a skill. And I, and I have to emphasize yeah. this. Yeah. Just knowing about how skill acquisition works is not enough to like, Oh, suddenly I'm going to learn faster. Right. So learn like, the skill of learning is a skill. So please take, for example, one of the things of the, of the three that we talked about and work on that first, right? And then second, add another one and just like the whole principle. So maybe you want to start off by um, doing the Pareto principle and then with some interleaving. So that means you're going to take your game, you know, figure out what are the, you know, top three or top th two things that you want to work on that you feel like would give you the most benefit right now or in the long term. And then do some interleaving for that. So meaning, you know, I'll do it this one way and then the second way, et cetera. And just do interleaving, for example, on an isolation for a little bit of time. And then when you feel like that becomes like second nature, then you'd add like the augmented feedback and da 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 Because I really can't hesitate, like emphasize this enough. This is something I'm personally a victim to and I recognize how detrimental it was for me is this thing that we do, like for example, watching a shit ton of like, you know, pro guides and all these like videos on how to improve and you think that by just watching more videos you're learning more but if it's not being applied that's just information that whoosh, boom out of the window through the forgetting curve right yeah so we need to like take it step by step so even those three principles take them like step by step and just do them so <clears throat> the like the 10 tips that we're gonna, gonna go through kind of a little bit more faster that are, are mostly like science-based as well neuroscience-based uh number one and I, this, everyone in Voltaic knows, knows me for this as well. Uh, and then I can plug in some, I don't know if you have descriptions, um, DDK, I can give you some links to some resources that I yeah, created. Perfect. perfect. 
So number one would be first and foremost working on the hardware. By the hardware, I mean this, right? I know as gamers, like now you're seeing it out of the esports, you know, at the high level where they're getting exercise, you're starting to see players be more physically active and doing things like meditation, etc. So, but let's go use an analogy to make it very simple to understand. Let's say, right, that you're a computer. This is your hardware, right? If you have a computer that has like an RTX 3090, like a graphics card, really, I, I even know how high they go these days. Um, so just think of like the highest one and then compare that to a really shitty, bad graphics card, right? No matter how much, you know, little tricks and tips and, uh, what is it called when you boost uh, the graphics card? I'm not really good with the tech. Overclock, um, overclocking. Yeah, overclocking. Yeah. No <laughs> much however clocking you do for the small, uh, crappy graphics card, it will never, ever amount to what a good graphics card can do on its worst day, right? And that's just to highlight that the hardware, if this hardware is not good, no matter how much training or how much you, you know, everything else that you do, it will not beat the guy who does the same amount of training, but his hardware is good, all right? So by that, I mean, there's a big correlation between, you know, your physical activity and your sleep and your diet in terms of like your health and overall performance in every sport this is like across the board if you're sleeping which is i know we're all you know you know blamed of especially in gaming if you're sleeping at 1 a.m and you're sleeping for five hours the next day you might not even beat me if i get my nine full hours okay even if you're rating it's just like the decrease in performance is astronomical astronomical if your hardware is not there all right so in that regard the focusing on the three things that are most important sleep getting exercise and and diet are the most important and there's some even more tricks that i can give you <clears throat> if you do exercise or sleep you can do both ideally you can do both right after a practice session like let's say that you practice for two hours of like in training and then you played and ranked in a whole spiel if you do a high burst of exercise or sleep after that session, your learning goes up dramatically. So for the exercise, it's in particular related to something called brain-derived neurotrophic factor, BDNF, and I don't know why people don't talk about this more. Um, it is a brain chemical that allows your neurons, right, to, to increase the rate at which they, they kind of make these new synapses. They make new connections in the brain. Basically, it makes it like your brain is always molding and changing itself as you learn. So it helps that process. So if you exercise, especially like high intensity exercise, and high intensity doesn't mean that you have to be working out for 40 minutes, you know, sprinting and dying. It can be like eight minutes and just kind of doing pull-ups and whatnot. Um, BDNF goes exponentially up, and the things that you were learning there go into long-term memory and learn them a lot faster. So that's like that's a, that's the first hack. That that's something I always like trying to incorporate. Um, secondly, also doing sleep and you don't have to sleep for like, it's not saying that like, you got to go sleep to, to sleep things like both, um, NSDRs is that what mm. we're starting to call it, which is non-sleep. Non -sleep yeah. 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 That's the Hebrew man that thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so things like just taking a nap for 20 minutes or by the way, don't go past 30. Try to do, try to do either like a full sleep of an hour and a half or more, or at least like naps less than 20 minutes there's reason for that but 20 minutes or then doing something like meditation also helps learning go exponentially up and it's basically because you're allowing your brain to sort of rest and it'll replay basically it'll replay all the things that you're doing and the things that we're learning it'll replay it subconsciously so that way you're kind of getting reps in without really necessarily getting reps in actively so on um, Sounds kind of confusing, but that's just kind of how it goes. Yeah. Um, it replays everything that you were doing. So that's that's one of the biggest hacks right there. Uh, any questions there, or do we move on to the second one? Well, um, one question actually is, um, one thing I haven't experimented with yet, but you just reminded me of with NSDR, is is using NSDR in, in the middle of like a, a practice session um, as, as mm -hmm. a break. Like, you know, if, if you're doing four hours at the two-hour point, just do like... Yes. Some NSDR because because you can do it within ten to twenty minutes, so it seems like okay. a, yeah, yes, be good. yes. So there we can go into we'll jump into the timing one because I we've alluded to it a couple times. So this goes into timing. 
So in terms of timing for practices and how to go about them. So there's something, uh, I don't know, I coined it or I just made it up, whatever you want to call it. Is uh, I call it OPT, optimal play time, right? So a lot of us like play for five, six, seven, eight hours straight. We already know that's not good. So we, but we all individually have an optimal amount of time that we can do based on the difficulty of the task that you're doing. Because like the harder the things that you're playing, the more your brain kind of like tires out because it's so demanding. And as well with like your individual ability to you know push through and stay active, right? So for example, what I would do is I would take out like a stopwatch, right? And I will start playing, right? And just turn on the stopwatch and be as focused and active as you can for as long as you can, right? And by this, I mean like you can't be, you know, during breaks, bring out your phone and watching YouTube. It doesn't mean like, oh, you should be dozing off and thinking about whatever. It's just try hard be a try hard for as hard as you can for as long as you can and see how long that is to stop the stopwatch usually us humans kind of work in an ultradian rhythm way where uh we do best for like sprints of like two hours basically so my time the hardest i could do when i, when I really tried my hardest was like two hours and a half and after that you just i just felt like you know I was on autopilot. So as soon as you feel things like fatigue and I'm mean, feeling like you're doing things on autopilot, you're done, right? So take note of the, how long that was, right? And this is something that you have, a lot of people do the Pomodoro technique as well, which is, it's like, oh, you do 45 minutes of practice and 10 minutes off and 45 minutes of practice and 10 minutes off. Yeah, so exactly. So you can kind of like also parse it out in multiple fragments. So usually what I recommend is do practice that's no longer than three hours in length in total, like in a, in a batch, but then also in between that three hours, do an hour and a half and an hour and a half. So like, for example, an hour of like intense practice, then take a break for like 20 minutes, because we, it's also shown that even if you don't go to sleep or to do an SDR or anything, any type of like small relief of rest from information allows your brain to kind of repeat it. Uh, they've even shown that, like, oh, if you're practicing and let's say you're, you're playing Valorant um, intensely, let's say that you finished a round, you don't even have to be thinking about the next round. You, if you can just, like, lay back and just come, I don't know, stare out the window, even doing that micro breast interval helps your brain kind of, like, replay mm. a lot of the things and consolidate things. So rest in between is, like, extremely OP, and people don't take <laughs> take moments to do that yeah. right so for example if you're playing one match of valorant maybe at the at the ever after every round you take 10 seconds to kind of just like uh, and then like rest and then go back into it. it's kind of like this coming in and coming back action and then so yeah i would do three hours maybe that's uh three matches plus like the warm-ups or whatever and then like at the at the at the halfway mark at an hour and a half i'll take a 20 minute break and usually the best breaks are either as we said exercise or like to sleep either meditate um take a nap for like 10 minutes or whatever naps it depends if you get really drowsy then maybe that's not the best but then most likely the best thing is like a motor action so things like um, walking or jogging or doing some kind of form of exercise the worst thing you can do for a break is you're still keeping <laughs> your brain you're still keeping your brain active so you're not doing any of the resting and you're not letting any information consolidate right this is the worst thing we can do and i'm, I'm i've been i do it sometimes i'm i can't say i'm like perfect or anything it happens but if i'm really trying to actually my hardest to be like a professional player this is not something i would do i would take my phone leave it in the next room and then put stuff around me to make sure I kind of exercise in those breaks and do something else. Okay. Is there any questions there with the time? No, oh, the, no, other thing I was gonna, the other thing I was going to mention is this also kind of plays with like the distributive practice principle, right? So instead of doing, for example, if you want to practice six hours in your day, don't do it straight. As we were saying, usually our brain kind of does best between two to three hours at most. That also has to do with flow. But to, for example, a two or three hour session in the start and then another one in the afternoon, for example, the ideal practice in my gaming day would be practice in the morning, do then one in the afternoon, and you're kind of done. And those two hours, those two sessions of six hours will do you much better if you're doing them properly than the guy who's playing, you know, 12 hours, burning himself out, yeah. and then basically forgetting everything the next day and have to repeat and recycle. Okay? We're yep. good? Yep. And that's that, that's something I advocate to people too because it's I, I experimented with that and did that rigidly and I found it was 
uh, like less practice or as very uh very very sensitive to precisely how much energy and focus and what the quality was um that 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 was by far the best um practice i've ever had and especially when it's like routine and, and i also optimized the sleep and exercise around it it was even even the bad the bad sessions felt fine and i don't think even ever happened honestly it just it just was always like this way more consistent yeah it's a, it's a, it's a little hacks my friend and then yeah. so i think on the, the third one i think we're on number three now uh so the third one was actually the software so it could we kind of jumped around but it was like hardware which is your body and the and your brain i consider the brain part of the hardware as well but then the software so this is interesting right so Software, we can think about as the same thing as the computer. There's like, you know, um, the Apple software, the Mac app, like software, there's Windows, there's Linux, right? And each, let's say, let's say you have, a, you have an app, right? Let's say it's a, I don't know, Facebook or whatever. It, the app kind of like looks different and behaves differently based if it's on Windows, Apple, or Linux, right? Like, I don't know if you've noticed that different apps sometimes behave differently, feel different, and perform differently based on the software. So this is kind of like an analogy in terms of like the mindset stuff. And I know it's kind of like wishy-washy, blah, blah, blah. It's a mindset. But the importance of this is, is can't be underplayed. And it's been proven in research, right? So in terms of like a mindset, we can think about things like the fixed mindset versus like the growth mindset. And I'm someone that had, I, had, I did have a fixed mindset for a time. And it's something that we gamers are also are frequently victims of. And I'll tell you why. This is now tying in things like from Dr. K, Dr. Alec Kanoja, healthy gamer, best guy, is a lot of like the population of gamers, we, it's, I think of the number statistics, don't quote me on this, it was like, oh, we're, it's like on average 20% smarter than the general population. It was something like that. It was weird. Uh, don't quote me. But basically the concept was like, gamer, gamers are pretty smart. And then from an early age, we recognize that we have these skills, and then people tell us, "They're oh, you're so smart, you're so good. Look how good you are in this game. Oh, you're how can, how can you do these things?" Blah 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 blah. And that creates kind of like the self identity of like, "Oh, I'm smart. Like, I got this. I should be able to do this, right? I, this, this, these things come easy to me." The problem becomes that when things actually get difficult we don't push past those boundaries because it would shatter that concept of who we are. Like, things should come to easy to me. Things, you know, I'm good at everything, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that's where the problems like really come start to arise. On the other side, we have like the growth mindsets. These are the people, and they've done experiments on this to show it, are the people that like embrace the challenges, acknowledge that they they're, are not gods, they don't know everything, and that helps them improve. It has shown that like people who have this kind of mindset are more easily accepted, um, perceptive of errors, like things to improve on and grab on. And like, oh, I need to work on this. Oh, and this is what happened. I can do this, et cetera, right? And they persist for longer. So that means that even when things get hard, they keep pushing. On the side of the fixed mindset person, they kind of just go on autopilot because they kind of like deny like oh self-deprecating oh i did this bad like i suck etc cetera, etc cetera. and secondly they give up faster now, i don't know about you but my experience in ranked and matchmaking is like ff at third round mm -hmm. yeah pretty much yeah yeah <laughs> yeah I thought, and I, right the mindset people tilting huge. people tilting after like one misplay people like trying to surrender after like oh uh, this is the third round i lost like ff yeah. whatever and you see this more and more and more and more and this kind of ties in yeah. to the software so the people so like, the, the things that i'm saying like guys if you work on these basic principles you're already like ahead of 95 percent of the people right yeah. just these simple things that are not really that simple it's hard to actually work on but they will get you there. So how do you work on something like, you know, becoming a growth mindset? Number one, the most important thing is now you have that self-awareness. So like when you go into games, you can work on the specific skill, right? And be like, how did I react to this? How can I improve X or Y? You know, just being like more cognizant of these things. And maybe having a little notebook or something that you're writing down, like how things are going, how are you feeling, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There's, there's many different ways, but it's extremely important. Uh, with that, we can move into the next one, or do you have anything you want to discuss there? I, I, I could add something. Um, 
I, I I talk a lot about framing framing tools, and one of the like the best I think video uh, is is uh, Jocko Willink's Good because that's that's basically just growth mindset stuff. It's just literally anything that you that that is possibly could be conceived as negative, perceived as negative. You just you say you know you say you say good, and and you and it's all about turning it all into a challenge. And it's all a reason. Oh, this is a reason to get better. This is a chance to an opportunity to be better. This is you know, it's just, it doesn't matter what it is. It's always mm -hmm. an opportunity to be better. So that staying within that challenging space is really important, and that's also key because dealing with uh, with pressure requires you to be skillful at doing that. Because when you get pressured, this is when you know a lot of mental game leaks can happen, and a lot of it is about how you perceive the pressure and so if you're really practiced mm -hmm. in 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 turning that like feeling of like nervousness or uncertainty around into oh this is this is good this means i'm in the right place this is what i want to be doing you know if you're able to keep practicing that that will help you a lot in competition when you're experiencing like very difficult uh environments yeah that that man i, I think we're gonna need another talk to this <laughs> yeah i think so yeah, I think because so. there's a lot of things that come into play the, the reframing that's like a cognitive behavioral technique um it works very well i personally uh have a lot of difficulty as well like remembering to do this like i think all of us do right so it's something that we need to work on step by step but the, th the trick that i use and all my players that i work with know i'm very visual so i would do like a post-it note or something that uh, i don't write words I use symbols. I think symbols and images are a lot easier like to appreciate the, you know, pictures that's a thousand words. So I would put a symbol or something that represents me like, oh, embracing effort or difficulty or something like mm. that. And just having that post-it there would always like keep me in check and reinforce what I'm trying to do. And then the other things that we were mentioning, um, yeah, I would we would have to have another conversation on how to perform on game day and how the how right. stress, anxiety and all these other things impact their previous training and how that can also be um combated through different ways so that's the, the i think today we've mostly talked skill acquisition but then yeah there's yeah the performance side of like how to perform on that specific day um so yeah and then, so another thing so that just kind of like keep running a little bit quicker i think yes. uh in terms of other things are very important one having goals so be very specific about the goal being like, I have so many players who the first thing that we go into, like when they come into AMS and we're doing training is like, what are you trying to get good at? And they're like, I just want to get good. <laughs> it's the problem with that is like, one, you can't track it. Right. So what, how do you define good? What is the thing that you're trying to get good at? And then secondly, if you can't track it, the person lose a lot of motivation because you don't know, you never know if you're there. You never know if you're getting better, actually better or not, or working towards the thing that you want to get good at, right? And then third, it makes it so that the line that you have to go from here, where you are at, to where you want to be, it's very skewed because you don't know where you want to be. So for example, if you want to be a pro player or whatever, you need to know the steps that it takes through the shortest distance from here to there, right? From A to B. If you don't have the specific goals that get you to that that specific goal, you might, you know, be without a compass and move around the waters until you finally get there someday. But you took five times as long because you didn't know how to get directly from here to there because that's where you wanted to go. You never knew, right? So in terms of goals, that's where you know there's a very famous acronym called SMART, which is make your goals very specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and time bound. Right? We don't have to go into each one, but basically, don't be like, oh, I just want to be a pro. Usually the best thing is to have like a long-term vision, which is good. Like I just want to be a professional esports player. That's a good vision. Let's call it a vision instead of a goal. But the goal itself, usually the best um, that I also heard from Dr. Huben was parse it out into like uh, 12 week goals and then smudge and shorter goals. So basically, okay, for the next three months, what is my goal? I want to improve my headshot percentage, you know, I don't know, but from, let's say you're horrible and you're at 15, I want to improve it to 50% on, on average, right? So that's very specific. It's time balance in three months, et cetera, et cetera. And then you make, from there, you make the smarter, the, the shorter goals, which is, okay, how do I increase my headshot percentage to like whatever? So that's where like, okay, so maybe my goal is for this week, um, practice this scenario here, this amount of times, get this amount of percentage on our score on it, et cetera, et cetera. So you basically have to reverse engineer the vision into smaller steps and goals, 
right? And that way you're actually going into more of a straight line to attain it. So moving to the next one would be the one trick pony. So I highly recommend one tricking. And this, you know, it's something you, you see this very famously in people like um and in League of Legends, right? There's uh the, the Zed players in Valorant, those are those cipher mains, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So people who kind of just always flex and do different roles. The problem with that is like each character is a different style, different macro, and even different mechanics in a lot of the times, right? So every time that you reset and try a different one, you just do it to someone different, your brain, like, like we said, we learn in steps, right? We're, we're adding one layer of knowledge on top of the other, right? So let's say that your jet level is here because your fundamental skills and your mechanical skills are up to here. If you suddenly go to Cypher, you have to go down here, right? Because the, me the mechanical skills that translate to each other is just this much, and the rest is you have to redo it, right? So even worse than that, if you change from a different character and the, the play style and all these decision-making changes, that's going to interrupt kind of like the subconscious things that you usually normally do because your brain is having to focus on like, oh, I should dash here, do this and do that. That means that you have less attention and working memory to allocate to things that you were doing like, oh, checking the mini map and checking this. And these are the things that you usually kind of like do out of habit it becomes harder because like all your attention is focused on how to play Jen, right? Because you, know, you barely play her. So usually my recommendation is not necessarily to just play one character. You, at the start, you usually kind of, you know, play them all, feel for what's your, your favorites, but then pick two, you know, your main and then your backup and push those as far as you can till all the different layers, especially mechanical, become subconscious. And as you, you develop your subconscious mechanical stuff, then your brain frees up for like more macro decisions. You have more space in your head to think about, okay, how many skills were used? I mean, how have I been checking my minimap? How's my communication? Once these other things have already been worked on and they're really well grounded, right? That's the, that's the next tip. Uh, so the other one would be replicating before you innovate. And that's something I'm also very, uh, I've done in the past, which has screwed me over, is replicating before you innovate. That means, let's say you picked out who are going to be your mains or who is the kind of like pro player you want to aspire to be or emulate, et cetera, et cetera. Before you start changing the ways of or having your own opinions about how they do things and then how you would change them, you can always be a analytical, but first just replicate everything they do, right? They might be have knowledge and that you just don't have yet, and you don't know the reason by the th ways and the things that they do. First, replicate what they're doing, right? And then once you kind of like getting to that more or less of that level of understanding, then you can like break off and be like, okay, I understand why this is being done, why they did this in this scenario, why they did this and this and this. And once you have all the information, you're like, oh, but maybe there's a different way to do things. The problem that I see is a lot of people, like you know, you you know the experience, goldy low, platinum, whatever. You can go all the way to the right, and they're always shooting at opinions at you. They're always saying like that was wrong, this was wrong, da da da. You don't really have that knowledge or anything yet to to facilitate that, right? So I think replicating is a good start before you emulate. Um, the next thing, well, we we talked about purposeful practice. The next thing would be the ideal level of difficulty and challenge. Right. So this is this comes back to a concept of like zone of proximal development. There's like the Yerkes Dotson law. There's all these different things. Is we do best and we learn best when the the arbitrary number that was kind of like I don't think it was arbitrary, there's some science behind it. It was like we do best when the things that we're doing are right at the limit of our cap of our or the, the edge of our capacities, right? So if we know that, let's say, you can finish a scenario um, with a score of 500, and that's like the best that you you can do, right? Usually we do best if we're trying to force ourselves to get to be more or less at that level or, or slightly around that level, right? If the challenge is not enough, what happens? You get bored. If the challenge is too hard, you become anxious. And that's going to affect how you practice and how you play and how you learn. So right at that first, like middle point where it's 
where it's not too hard, but not too easy, and kind of more approximating like the, the challenging aspect, more on that direction. That's where the sweet spot is. All right. Any questions there? No. Okay. Lovely. And then the last kind of like bonus tip, guys, I think I'll reorder one through like 10. The last bonus tip is actually getting a duo. And let me just be very, let me, let me clarify what that means. So I don't mean a duo, someone who's just playing ranked with you all the time. What I mean is we do better if we have sound boards, if we have individuals who are training with us, we have, we increase our motivation. We um, become more curious with other people versus if we're just always doing things alone, right? It doesn't mean you have to play ranked with them or anything. It's more about having someone or a couple people. I I don't I don't suggest having five, six, seven friends or whatever. It's people who motivate you to help you motivate it, keep you, you know, moving forward to become better, and then are always curious to test out things with you. Right. So I would have killed, you know, to have someone who was like, Oh man, I don't know if this strafe is the best or if I don't know if the way that I'm peeking here, they can see me or not. Just having someone who's like test things out with you is extremely exceptional. And then you know, someone who is also very energetic and, and really has that same mindset that you're aspiring to be, that would be even better. So if you have someone who who you want to kind of like emulate and is uh, has that mindset or the skills that you want and you can work with them like more doish, that's even better. Not necessarily a coach, but someone who's slightly better and has that mindset you kind of like aspire to be. And a lot of people do this in real life. You know, they have like the masterminds, they have mentors, they have... Um, I have this myself. I have a little mastermind with a couple other esports professionals that we, we kind of like work together and push ourselves. So having a duo or having a couple of people that have the same mindset that you want is also extremely beneficial. Um, I think that's like all the like nitty gritty tips and tricks that I had kind of like planned out. Uh, there's other ones for like performance and things like that, but maybe that's something best for another conversation. Yeah, because I know we've we've hit sort of your time limit essentially, uh, I believe. And yeah, I, covered, I gotta go to the clinic. <laughs> we covered a lot of good, well, fantastic ground. Um, so I guess that's a great place to to leave things. Um, you know, thank you so much for sharing all your thoughts around all of this.